Welcome back to our theater stage here at the Festival of the Future for a panel about a very important topic, which seems, uh, you know, it's called electrifying mobility, which seems obvious because everybody is uh, pretty sure about it, that we have to electrify mobility. But there are some challenges on the way and we want to find out how we can overcome those challenges and what those challenges are. Now I have to uh, add something to our the title. It's electrifying mobility, batteries, wings, and circularity to keep us moving. And we should add one more word, which is solar power. And you will soon fi find out why that is. But first, uh, let's welcome our panelists here. Welcome uh, Dr. Dirk Abendroth, the CEO of Custom Cells. <laughs> Lilian Schwich, the CEO of Silip. Yes. Ivo van Dartel, the co-founder and CEO of Eridion. <laughs> and Lars Löhle, the solar group lead product at Sono Motors. <laughs> I'm keeping it short, the introduction, because everyone will get the chance uh, to uh, hold a short impulse of a few minutes uh, to give us some idea of what uh, all of them are working on. And we start with uh, the thing we need for electrifying mobility probably the most with batteries, and that's why Dirk will be the first to give us an impulse. Hmm. Thanks very much, Wolf. Um, yeah, glad to have you. Uh, get, glad to have you and glad to be here. Um, yeah, I got into electrification something like um, 20 years ago. Uh, the very first kind of test runs uh, before uh, BMW i actually locally was, was built here. Uh, went out to Silicon Valley to see how that works. Um, built a new brand, uh, Byton, with a couple of friends. Um, back to China and then finally back here. Um, got a little bit into aviation um, and then found out everything which powers um, electrification are battery cells. So that's why I'm now CEO at Custom Cells. Custom Cells actually is uh, developing and manufacturing high performance, super high performance um, cells. Um, to customers like, like Porsche or locally here, Lilium, for example. So it's automotive, it's aviation, and a couple of very um, special applications. So you can think about kind of, you know, underground drillers and uh, some uh, submarine applications, underwater water applications, everything which is not just regular mass production, but um, has a certain challenge of very high power density or very high energy density. So that, that's what the company stands for. And if you look into where is electrification at the moment, then you could, you know, take this uh, from a customer's point of view, saying, where, where's automotive? Well, automotive at, um, at the very kind of early pioneer stages um, 15 years ago was something like, okay, crazy people do this, but you know, nobody will finally buy it, but let's see where this goes. Towards right now, regulation has actually followed up and shows us a clear path. Well, <clears throat> you'd like to kind of meet the regulations, there's not too much way around elect electrification. Well, it might be batteries, it might be hydrogen, but electrification definitely is uh, to a certain degree a given. So, and that's what we now see as well. Uh, prices come down, we see the energy densities reach a certain range, uh, translated into cars, into mobiles, into airplanes and EV tolls, etc. So especially car industry, right, gets into industrialization, cost down, quality, etc. Uh, and of course, afterwards, recycling, that's to come next. Um, but what happens now in terms of aviation? Well, the same thing is about to happen. So we can see that rising at the horizon, and the requirements are actually different. To a certain degree, there's quite some, you know, um, common sentiment, um, common technology, etc. But the requirements indeed are very different. Um, but um, there's always a place for high performance <laughs> because that's usually how you enter a market from the premium into the mass market. And that's exactly where custom cells has um, positioned itself. So coming from, from uh, premium extraordinary high performance and energy density. So how do we get there? Very simply speaking, um, as usual, you don't speak too much about the magic sauce, but you try to get people somehow at least involved. And um, well, I think there's um, three aspects at the moment which are something kind of um, make this uh, very special. Well, there's a trade-off between, okay, you'd like to jump to next generation of energy um, cells and uh, power cells. And that's kind of, you know, everybody, three years ago, everybody was just saying, okay, solid state is going to come and rule it in five years, and that's it. And then we're all going to have solid state. That obviously didn't happen for a couple of very good reasons. And most of them are actually somehow a combination between development, but mostly manufacturing of it. And um, so... Um, People started thinking, okay, lithium ion to a certain degree, well, lithium ion was that. And that's what people said kind of two, three years ago still. And now there's a couple of things just giving them a kind of a little bit larger window. I would say something like five to ten years more 
Um, and that is exactly where now aviation steps in, and that's the chance to get into it. We simply found kind of three ingredients. One is, um, well, um, there's a couple of very different and high performance anode materials. It's simply kind of material science is a very strong booster for um, developing cells to a higher stage of energy density and power density. Uh, well, another thing is kind of to simply increase the level of uh, silicium penetration you finally um, get into cells. That's something we have actually um, especially inve um, invested lots of energy into in terms of manufacturing, how to get this into the materials. And the very last thing is uh, something where we do have a really outstanding, um, say, um, advantage against all the competitors, uh, pre-lithiation. Well, you could think like this. Um, well, batteries get old. They simply age. That's like, like everybody for us. Um, that simply means that kind of the, the level you can use always becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And like, okay, what happens if people age? They try to find a way to somehow at least prolong it. And that's what we do by pre-lithiation is simply kind of putting in some materials which keep the cells longer, younger. And that's exactly the, three, the third ingredient. And how you mix it up finally is the secret, but that makes the difference. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, we, maybe you'll tell some secrets later in our discussion. Uh, now, producing great batteries um, is, is a good thing, but we are living in a time where resources are scarce. We have to uh, save everything that we can and reuse materials. And that's where Lillian comes in because she's uh, focused on battery recycling and will tell us more about what her newly founded startup Salab will do. Yes, I'm super excited to be here representing battery recycling and our startup Silip. Um, actually, yeah, to approach the topic um, in the frame of the higher demand for electric storage and also for commodities, secondary raw materials can play an important role for safeguarding the demands of the market, actually. So secondary raw materials are raw materials which do not come directly from mining, but have had a life beforehand. So some sort of recycling has been done to bring those secondary materials back to the loop. Back to the loop is an important uh, word for here. So a circular economy is an approach we really want to achieve for also establishing a sustainable traffic turn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, how do we approach that? There are special yeah, advantages of secondary materials for sure. For example, the production of secondary materials it takes less energy and also compared to an ore, the concentration of an element, for example, lithium, is higher than yeah, in the secondary materials. But recycling also comes up with several challenges, which can be divided into political challenges, structural challenges, or also technology, technological challenges. So um, from a political point of view, Firstly, there has to be some criteria on which elements are even critical. That means which elements are hard to substitute and are technologically super relevant. And um, with that, also a functioning battery legislative needs to be in place. So in Europe, we already do have a legislative, which is called the Battery Directive. And this Battery Directive is already a good baseline, but is under revision currently. So we are targeting higher recovery rates and also looking at elemental recovery rates even. So this is a very good yeah, development, but also some punishment has to be implemented if those targets are not reached uh, for recyclers. So um, from a structural point of view, uh, there are, for example, challenges in the whole collection and transportation sector. So this is something we should definitely focus and keep in mind. And moreover, several battery packs which are used in EV batteries uh, do have a different geometry. So this is, for, ch for recyclers, pretty challenging to find a good method for that. And so I think there should be a lot of communication upstream and downstream um, to really optimize all these structural topics. Yeah, from a technological point of view, Basically, um, as already said, there are challenges. For example, there are heaps of elements incorporated in a battery cell, which all have to be like separated by metallurgical methods. And moreover, batteries are made to last. So they should work well, work well for a long time. And so there are binders and strong bonds connecting all the components of the batteries, which a battery recycler needs to loosen to liberate the, the resources. And um, 
with that, um, uh, actually, as a metallurgist, which I am, I think the most impact I can have is on the technological side. So uh, that's why during my PhD and my co-founder of Paul's PhD, uh, we actually puzzled together all the process steps which are in place for recycling a battery and combining them to find the best available option. And this actually led to our startup Silip, where we are providing an uh, end-to-end solution for recycling uh, traction batteries. And this on the base of environmentally friendly methods and from a holistic approach, meaning we do not forego any um, components, but we can recover them all and make them reusable and therefore close the loop, achieving circular economy. So that's from us. Great, that's amazing. <laughs> now we heard two companies that are providing batteries. Now we hear two companies that use batteries in the product, and they are uh, local heroes from Munich, uh, which I'm uh, glad of. And Ivo will first talk about electrifying mobili uh, mobility, uh, air mobility, because that's not so common as, uh, as in cars. And he will tell you about his great startup, Veridion. So hi, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Now here, we are. Here we are. So servus. Um, welcome to Munich. Viridian is a startup that was founded only last year, and my co-founder uh, co and myself, we have an Airbus background, uh, among other topics, in the research on electric propulsion for, for aircraft. And why is this important? Because in eight years from now, there will be probably massive restrictions on air travel. We have the Paris Agreement, we have the EU Green Deal, the Klimaschutzgesetz, which means uh, the governments are now bound to take measures to reduce CO2 emissions. And which is, of course, a uh, very. And it is not working. The thing. It it should be. Ah, there it is. It is, and it so will be here in a second. Sorry for that. Wonderful. <laughs> so, um, one popular measure, or let's say one measure that voters can support, is restricting short haul air travel, um, <clears throat> because you could say there will be some alternatives there. Um, one most recent example is France, where they have passed a law: if a high speed train connection can get to a destination in two and a half hours, you are no longer allowed to offer a flight. Yet, there are people who depend on uh, short-haul flights, and there are also regions in the world that depend on uh, air infrastructure, for example, in northern Scandinavia. And there are also initiatives to promote a green air mobility by the year 2030. So this is where we come in. Um, if we first look at the problem, which range is most useful to work on? It's a short range, up to 1,000 kilometer uh, air, uh, trips by air will produce yearly 140 megatons of CO2. So if you start in the short range, you can really make a dent into the problem. And if you zoom in to private flying, I'm, I'm talking about small business jets, you even realize that 50% of these flights in, in Europe, they are up to 500 kilometers. And per passenger kilometer, this is of course the worst of the worst in emissions. So what is the kind of airplane we should work on if we want to do something by the year 2030 that helps solve this problem? On the right-hand side, you see the big research projects uh, by the likes of Airbus, which have, uh, has an horizon of 2050. On the left, small aircraft, which have limited commercial use. So we are in the middle in what we call a commuter aircraft. So our mission is to de design, certify, and build a e battery electric microliner by the year 2030. And mm, did I jump? Ah, here it is. Um, which kind of looks like a normal airplane, doesn't it? But what we do is we optimize it for energy consumption. Because battery electric offers you great things in efficiency, but you have to compensate for the lack of energy. So the whole aircraft is designed about minimizing uh, uh, energy in flight, long slender wings like a big glider. And then we have the potential in being the most efficient mode of transport at all. If you sit alone in your Tesla Model 3, you will consume more energy per kilometer than if our aircraft is full with nine passengers. That brings us to opening new routes because we can also make it cheaper. We can connect regions that don't have infrastructure. We can generate energy locally with solar energy, which is already being built at the local airports right now as a source of revenue. And actually the potential is huge, 160 million passengers for domestic flights in uh, 2019 in Europe, 1.4 billion is it working? Passengers traveling 150 to 600 kilometer trips in Germany, 80% by car. So I don't think that by the year 2030, everyone who owns a car will own an electric car. So we also need to be more efficient with the materials. All in all, 
green air mobility makes sense. You save time, you save emissions, you save energy. And if you want to know where you can travel, please try our app. It's a little bit fun, but uh, you cannot book a flight yet, but hopefully soon. <laughs> But pretty soon, and you ha can have a look at a model uh, of uh, his airplane uh, down in the experience area. So you should check uh, check it out, and you can use the app there. And now I think we're back on track with our technical setup. And from air mobility, we go back to the ground, but with a totally new concept as well. And Lars will tell us about the mission and vision of uh, solar vehicles. Exactly. So. That is working, perfect. So hi everyone, um, and thanks Wolfgang and team uh, for, for having me, and uh, fantastic uh, views on battery, both in the air and of course the development and recycling. Um, so, uh, solar on every vehicle, um, that's actually our mission. I, I would like to um, start with the, now it's working, um, with our vision, and actually why I joined Sono four years ago. So our mission is a world without fossil fuels. Um, in transportation, we're focused on transportation, not in the air yet, uh, everything uh, which is moving on the ground. And our mission towards achieving actually this vision is solar on every vehicle, which you see um, right on that pic. So um, what I'm actually doing at, at Sono, I'm leading the business development and product management of on a, our Sono Solar business unit. So we're um, spread into three three business units currently. And um, I wanna go one step back though before I'm heading a bit more into details what we're actually doing in that business unit. So why solar? I mean, we're seeing great elect electrification, uh, we're seeing um, great improvements on batteries, uh, now recycling, which is super important. But of course, uh, what kind of energy we're actually putting in there is super important as well. We, we can't just exchange every um, internal combustion engine um, car into, into an electric car and everything is solved. So we believe in actually sharing cars, but also sh sharing them and um, uh, supplying them with clean energy. And clean energy to us means, of course, we will have more wind turbines, more solar parks in the future. and. And uh, of course, we are fully supporting that. But actually, the most efficient way is having solar right at the thing which needs the energy. And our things are buses, trucks, refer vehicles, and of course, our own car design. And I mean, there were two big important trends the last 10 years, 12 years, 20 years in solar. It got cheaper, cheaper, and cheaper, and it got more efficient. And right now, we really believe we're in the intersection where it really makes sense integrating also on smaller surfaces, not huge solar wind parks, uh, solar parks as, as we see them out there, but also on actually vehicles. So let me jump to the next one. So basically, those lead us to two big strategic business pillars we have. I think we're, at least in, in the Munich Bavarian area, quite known now for our solar electric vehicle. So it will be um, launched and uh, shipped actually by the second half of next year, 2023. And um, this is a mass car, I would say. So we are actually not starting in the premium sector. We want to have it in the affordable range. It's a family friendly car and um, we have different cool functions beside the solar. We have bi-directional charging, also very interesting uh, if we look in the future, stabilizing our grids out there. And um, what is actually uh, pretty nice and a, and a good success, we already have over 19,000 reservations, um, paid down, uh, down payments actually for our uh, sign. Second pillar, and I would like to start with the why here as well. Of course, we, we uh, started six years ago with developing the sign for, for our uh, community and reservation holders. But there's a big but in transportation sector, mass transportation, food and beverages, people mover. We need to electrify those as well. High energy demand. So we are actually at the same thing. And I brought two short examples for you, 
where we actually out there already in the streets, streets of Munich and uh, streets of France and Europe actually. Um, we have signed all in all 19 partnership agreements since 2021, so we, we see quite a high demand for, for our solar technology, which is pretty flexible in terms of uh, applications. And those two examples I brought with you is one on actually a diesel bus, uh, it's a bus trailer actually here in Munich, uh, with high energy demands and what we're doing here, we're uh, supplying the 24 voltage battery in order to um, ease up the stress basically on the diesel generator and therefore saving uh, diesel consumption. And um, the second example I brought with you is a trailer built in France with our partner uh, Choro. And that's currently happening actually. We're uh, putting up to 10 kilowatt peak on that trailer. So that's quite a massive amount of energy for, for one vehicle. And we're cooling the goods there. And we're not only using the roof here, but actually both sides um, to, to uh, get as much uh, energy as possible off it. And um, that's basically it. Um, let me have one more word. Uh, we have an exciting event uh, coming up on Monday. Uh, it's called Celebrate the Sun. We need the sun for our business. So um, we are actually revealing our uh, serious validation vehicles there. Um, so newest generation, uh, it's gonna be exciting at, uh, at Wanda Circus, so everyone who stays in Munich or is from Munich, um, you're happily invited to join us. Going to be exciting. And uh, now back to you. <laughs> Thanks. But first, you come back tomorrow and the day after here to the festival because it's going on and tomorrow and, <laughs> and Sunday the admission is free. Thanks for all those insights. Now, that all sounds pretty good, but it also sounds pretty complex. Lily, you mentioned how hard it is to recycle a battery when the battery manufacturer tries to make it as durable as, as possible, as efficient as possible. That sometimes makes it harder to recycle it. Uh, Ivor, you are, uh, you know, completely reinventing the way that aviation is done now because there is no uh, commercial electric airplane running, and you started to ship uh, the uh, the solar um, applications for um, in first projects now, but it's all just the beginning. So where are we at the moment in the you know in the the t uh, mission to really electrify mobility? There is a lot of things, a lot of uh, good stuff going on at startups, but how do you see the big picture now, the, the overall situation with, you know, the background of all this crisis going on? Eva, maybe you want to start? All right. So the good news is that for our application, virtually all the technology is there. We do not need to wait for a breakthrough. We have battery cells that are now reaching the energy densities that we need. We have uh, charging infrastructures being developed already for automotive that we will scale for our needs. The infrastructure is there, and we know how to build airplanes of this kind of class. Eh? It's a conventional takeoff and landing airplane. So what we need to do is take all the existing things, and not to forget also the motors and power electronics, which are also being developed for air purposes. So what we need to do is we need to take that, integrate it, and engineer it, and then certify it. And this takes time because an airworthiness authority needs to assess that it's safe to use it. This, this is just a matter of execution. But all the basic technology is there, which is not the case for some of the alternatives that are being presented, where basically the fundamental technology bricks have to be still developed and the whole ecosystem around. For battery electric, the, let's say, e-mobility on the road has paved the way on which we can take off. Derek, maybe you want to add uh, regarding battery production as well. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, in the end, there's always kind of two different challenges. One one is usually kind of what we call just simply POC, so proof of concept, just to show it, it works once. And uh, just building a demonstrator, you know, is a totally different thing than building a serious prototype, um, no matter whether it's a car or a plane. Both of it takes years. And if you look into the design, then most probably kind of from a, um, say, very naive point of view, they might look similar or even the same. But if you look inside something, you can actually build, like you say, build pretzels, yeah? That's kind of produce pretzels, just all the same thing in a high quantity. It's totally different uh, engineering, totally different um, um, uh, stage of development, usually. It takes significantly longer time to get this into mass scale. That's where automotive currently now is heading towards, and we see that. To, to, so to my, um, to my um, very personal view, it looks like um, if you compare the two things like, okay, 
POC and um, mass manufacturing um, industrialization. And for automotive, uh, those two are already kind of underway and tick in the box. For aviation, uh, I think the first one is, is, is to a certain degree given. We see a couple of uh, prototypes getting in. It's significantly other, uh, easier to get it certified for just you know one single plane, but for a serious um, uh, certification, that's kind of hard work and takes a lot of time. That's not yet here, it's my feeling. But I would like to make a different comparison, which you already tried to teaser. So if you if you now compare where is electrification when the overall the overall target is, as you said, sustainability, CO2, CO2 footprint, uh, water consumption, whatever have you. So let's look, have a look and step back. Kind of what what is done. My feeling is that the being emission free in terms of mobility um, itself actually is available. It's about to be available here. It's already existing here, but the energy, to a certain degree, and we, we do have a, a very uh, say, challenging political situation right now, which kind of puts that straight in front of us, saying, okay, where is our clean energy? Uh, it has been there all the time, but now it really becomes visible. And if you compare in terms of, okay, all these things need to move in parallel to finally give us a really sustainable mobility, then I would say the vehicles and the battery cells, et cetera, are pretty much there. On the energy side, we do have some homework left. I think we are not r right there uh, when it comes to recycling because you already mentioned there is some regulation to be done. Um, do you see uh, the political awareness for this or are they right now dealing with something else because we have so many crises going on at the same time? No, I definitely see political awareness, absolutely. Um, yeah, especially on this European level, this is um, already pretty yeah, pretty good in a good state. Uh, on the other hand side, in the US, for example, there is not so much regulation going on. And um, as already teasered a bit, um, the punishment of not recovering what should be recovered will be uh, realized on a national baseline. So this means that the German laws need to be like connected to the European laws to really fulfill everything which should be fulfilled. But yeah, for sure, there is awareness to really close the loop and this is also reflected by public uh, incentives, for example, like uh, research calls or so. There are a lot for yeah for that case. Now, Dirk, you already mentioned that the energy is the shortage right now, the clean, the green energy, and we are the shortage is even growing right at the moment. Um, so, if you electrify mobility, we need much more green energy because otherwise it makes no sense. So, what role could like the production of energy using cars, but that's not sufficiently alone, not yet, but also the EV, um, all EVs together as a part of the, um, the grid, what, what role can they play in, in even maybe helping to, to get there? Um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the thing we, we have basically in mind. First of all, we, we offer bidirectional charging, so you can actually see the sign as a power bank, if you want to so, say so. So we can uh, charge vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to device, vehicle to grid. So that's going to be um, the, the most um, exciting um, things about the, the battery and bidirectional uh, charging, of course. But, but as just mentioned, I mean, we're still pretty dependent um, grid-wise on fossil fuels. So in there, we have to, to also take action. And um, looking, looking at our car, I mean, we integrated 456 um, half solar cells into the outer body. And um, as, as your question was before, um, where, where do we stand? And we also see big OEMs now um, at least offering a solar roof, um, not enough in our opinion and with different technology. But um, I think the awareness is rising and um, we, we also see that the mass market is actually um, adopting to or adapting to um, EVs, you need more comfort. I mean, I'm living in the fifth floor here in Munich. I don't have like a garage or anything. I don't even possess a car. <laughs> but uh, anyway, if I would, I, I would have uh, my troubles from time to time. I'm, I'm che just checking from time to time what's, what's out there in terms of charging infrastructure. And with our car, um, and of course our technology is usable with different cars, etc., you actually um, get 5,800 kilometers um, for free each year due to the solar integration. So that is basically half of the energy you need to drive your car uh, basically throughout the whole year on average uh, as a European citizen. So um, I think we, we need to 
to really um, think in that direction. Efficiency on a car level, how to use it, and of course, which energy we actually supply there. Dick, you wanted to add something? Yeah, um, just going back to where, okay, where does energy origin from? Uh, one thing, then obviously the also the kind of the pattern of the source look um, pretty different. So if you just take kind of a nuclear plant and hold it right next to a solar um, a field, and then finally you will see quite a difference. And that's obvious. The same holds true also if you think about uh, wind energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one thing I wanted to point out is very simply speaking that we do see also a, a significant need for a change of, of the infrastructure. I'm just talking about whenever you generate the energy more, say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a distributed way compared to a central one, then obviously the overall infrastructure looks different. And by the way, the same holds true for the uh, pattern over time. So finally, you do have a time dependency, for example, saying, okay, well, I might be out during the day, my solar panel is walking, I come back and would like to charge my car during the night, so where's the energy? Well. You need to have storage. That's called ESS, energy storage systems. Well, we are not producing them. It's different kind of batteries. Um, but that's one of the key challenges as well. So look into electrification. The biggest challenge there, uh, despite the, the um, energy actually, is uh, the charging system, the infrastructural aspect. Because usually that's uh, something which is kind of usually hard to, do, to build business on. And it's something which is get subsidized, et cetera, et cetera, and need kind of fixed um, kind of installments, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing holds true for energy generation, but also for, for the infrastructure behind and the storage systems behind. So that's one of the key challenges, finally, to get the electrification of mobility where it should be. Now, Ivor, you already mentioned that um, mobility patterns could change. If flying is, is um, suddenly more efficient and more energy efficient than driving an electric vehicle or a, um, a train, maybe even, um, Patterns might change, but what has to change if you look at aviation regarding this infrastructure? Because we have a charging infrastructure for EVs, but we don't have a charging infrastructure at all for um, electric um, airplanes. That, that is correct. But the most important infrastructure that we need is there. And we have, in Germany alone, 300 airfields that we can use. And you know how many ICE train stations we have? 180. And, and those train stations are only built at places where you can have enough passenger demand to justify to build the rail track and to have the big train with 900 seats. And this should continue, this is important. But for those regions where you could not build this infrastructure, you can go to the nearest local airport and be, thanks to the battery electric drivetrain, due to the lower operating cost, offer such a kind of private aircraft experience to the, let's say, normal business traveler. It's not going to be cheap but it's going to be affordable for someone who needs to go somewhere fast because he has a business need, for example. And the charging infrastructure, that is the last uh, step in the chain. So right now, um, lots of these small regional airports who have surfaces that they cannot use for anything else, they're putting solar uh, parks there, currently as an additional source of revenue, but also preparing the future. And then the last bit is, of course, the charging infrastructure, which is, I would say, a minor uh, adoption if you compare uh, what the effort is of building a new airport. I don't need to mention the Berlin airport project. <laughs> uh, and actually, there was already an airport there. Um, but uh, the, yeah, th th there is something to be done, but it's actually a minor uh, adjustment, I would say. Now, before we open up for questions to the public, um, what is the most pressing issue that needs to be solved right now in order to get a real zero emission mobility, not just zero local emissions, but like really zero emission mobility. What would you say? Maybe each of you can name one thing that, that should be solved right now because we, time is running. We have to have our CO2 emissions by 2030. That's almost tomorrow. And we are talking about infrastructure here that takes years. Um, so what's the most important thing right now? Lily, maybe you want to start? Um, yeah, for sure. I would say it's the infrastructure also around the driving only, so the where the raw materials come from and how they are recirculated, and therefore um, we need like good processes for assuring this circulation. That's what's, what's your most pressing issue. Um, I mean, it's simple: put solar on every vehicle, but of course, if possible, also on every every house roof, basically. Put in a storage, and if you don't have a storage, take your sign or any other battery electric vehicle and uh, store the energy and give energy back if you need it in your household. To me, what's actually um, mostly missing is 
a very honest discussion in public and a real willingness to do it. And the sounds we can check here now. Yeah. I would say there are also some important steps to be taken. At least uh, now, I think the geopolitical reality has kicked in in, in almost everyone's minds. And already a couple of years ago, uh, at least in Europe, there's been investments being made in uh, battery production or, or other things related to the, uh, let's say, energy transition. Um, this can, of course, be accelerated, um, uh, incentivized. I mean, if we're going to spend lots of money on research and development, maybe also distributed a little bit differently, not only to the good old same big corporations, but also to some of these new companies right here. Um, on the other hand, I also believe uh, on top of the sustainability factor, there's also a good business case behind. So if we can uh, deliver, let's say, better experience or at, a, or at a lower cost, the same experience, you don't only need to believe in the climate change emergency, but it also just makes sense for your wallet or for your spending of time. And, and this can also uh, be emphasized a little bit more. It's also simply just a really good idea to fly electrically, not just because it's important for the environment. Thanks for that. Now, who's willing to do the change now? Please raise your hands. OK, Dirk, you might have been right. Um, so are there any questions uh, from the audience right now to one of our panelists? Raise your hand, please, and then you'll get a mic. There's one over here already. There it is. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to Sono Motors. Um, I have a few friends and family who try to basically get uh, f uh, solar panels on their rooftops currently, and it's almost impossible to get any because the market is basically empty. <laughs> um, and I would assume that the capacity factor of a car is just lower, given it's like half of the panels are not facing sun most of the time, or it's parked indoor or something like that. Shouldn't the priority be first to put solar on every roof and then put it on the cars? Or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, fair, fair point from that perspective. Nevertheless, uh, I mean, what we, what we believe in is that you also um, uh, going away from sustainability, but towards comfort. I mean, um, people are really... I mean, you, you have to push them towards those things. And I mean, it gives you just extra comfort if you don't have to charge that often. We, we, have, a, we have a simulation model um, with, with a car with exactly the same battery size, exactly the same weight of the car. And um, during, during the uh, summer month, you have to charge four times less uh, the car. So that's where we, we, where we want to be. Um, at the end, with a, with a um, just just to be on the safe side, with an average European uh, driving behavior, we're we're usually driving between 16 and 18 kilometers a day in Europe, so it's it's not a lot. And supply chain, yes, uh, it is an issue. I think uh, on on every level, I guess uh, batteries are, are, are probably probably somehow the same. Um, but uh, of course, we're not taking standard PV modules as, as you see it on the roof. So we have totally different uh, material stacks, etc. So it's kind of, of course, the cells, we, we would compete here on our, to, towards our house roof, but actually the modules are uh, totally different, the technology behind. Thanks for that. Are there other questions? Well, sorry, Hannes, there's one right <laughs> on the other side of the room. <laughs> Take your time. There, I, oh yeah. <laughs> the back, oh he, yeah, he, he's coming. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Ivor, um, and um, it's about like it's really exciting to hear about those uh, commuter airplanes, like these small electrical airplanes, and uh, how would you like see the future of like mass transit or like mass. Uh, tra air traffic with these yeah. uh, kind of uh, planes. Like, do you see yeah. them more more of those smaller planes, or uh, is it better to develop larger planes yeah. uh, with uh, like more capacity? And uh, yeah, how, how do you see it? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so today, um, air travel or aviation is is depending on economies of scale because the margins are very very small. So uh, what is done is you concentrate the largest amount of people on large airports and you put them in large airplanes and then the margin is small but slightly enough to get a, maybe a profit if you're an airline. One in three makes a profit. 
And I think recently we've seen the limits of the system. I don't know if anyone's been to Amsterdam Airport in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. You have to stand five kilometers in line outside the terminal. Um, so, uh, and also in the pandemic, people, uh, let's say those who could afford it, are trying with the private chartering, etc. So, um, there's a system limit of what you can do with battery electric. You cannot fly to New York with a battery electric aircraft. At lot, I don't think in the next 100 years. Um, so a small airplane is something that is feasible, but it gives an advantage because we can make uh, traveling by air decentralized. So we're going to move a lot of people, but we're going to pick them up much closer to where they live. 20 minutes driving, 80% of the people in Germany have a small airport, and fly them closest to where they need to be. So there's a first and last leg, maybe with a nice so Sonar Motors car. And, um, and then we can also offer these, let's say, uh, flights uh, because the operating cost will be significantly lower than if you would do it today. Energy cost is lower, maintenance cost is lower, smaller moving parts. So uh, in the end of the day, it's then up to how much is your network. So you need to have lots of these airplanes spread around. So in the end of the day, you're still moving lots of passengers, but you're not need to, you don't need to concentrate them anymore. And you can also make your energy generation local. So I think this is the future for our trips up to 500 kilometers. Uh, uh, we will spread the people, we will spread the airplanes, and uh, then it's possible. Dick wanted to add something. That I wanted to ask him, what do you, th what do you have to say about the 100 years for a long-range flight <laughs> <with> batteries? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, straightforward. First of all, I think I just wanted to add another aspect. So I see people um, like you saying, well, I do not even own a car. And I do see lots of people, especially um, younger generation, um, just saying, okay, I do not even target to own a car. What I do need is mobility. So it just becomes something like, okay, I don't need to possess, I don't need to show, I just would like to use it. Um, so mobility becomes rather uh, kind of a thinking like, okay, I need a watcher or an app. And that's finally what I need. So it goes to multimodal um, traffic. So that's why finally asking, okay, how does the, the mix look like? Well, that's not something usually you kind of decide for yourself. It's a, simply a result of how your infrastructure looks like. Well, that finally dictates it. And then how the how the demand actually um, distributes across that. So overall, I do believe that this um, kind of um, thinking um, mobility instead of a vehicle will definitely increase significantly. Another aspect, 100 years, I wouldn't be... Um, too much excited if that if that happens earlier. I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that could be. So if you, for example, think about, I just could go very far away now from, from what we discuss here, just to give you kind of an, uh, an idea. So if you look into nuclear plants and uh, how huge they are, these are just kind of square kilometers uh, covered. Um, and not talking about the infrastructure around that. Um, if you now look into the latest startup companies, for example, three or four in Denmark, who have thought about Denmark in terms of nuclear power, they build lots of kind of small cubes, um, just, you know, uh, containers. And that's the size of, of nuclear power right now. Well, you could size that down to a significantly smaller size too. And then energy density comes definitely very close to yeah. what you need for from Munich yeah. in New York, as an example. But lithium iron won't get you there. Well, are we talking about nuclear powered uh, airplanes now? I remember from oh. my childhood days that I had a book yeah. from the 80s and there was like, that's how yeah. the future is going to look like, and everything was powered by nuclear engines. Um, but a hundred years. I is thought it was, that was over. <laughs> so but a hundred years is really, really long time span. <laughs> so if I if I may, add, I, I once had the pleasure to design a nuclear powered unmanned aircraft for Mars to find life, and then the ESA committee said, "Well, we believe it could fly, but if you find life, then it would probably have died because of the radiation." <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I, I, what I wanted to say with the 100 years is, is the lithium-ion battery uh, curve, of course. But, uh. oh, all right, so nuclear would, would take us to New York earlier. Uh, are, th are there any more questions? <laughs> Please raise your hand or wave, because it's pretty dark over there. If not, I want to add one word that we didn't use so much. What about hydrogen? <laughs> so where, where will it, uh, what role will it play? Uh, German politicians? Um, we're putting a lot of money and energy into a hydrogen e economy, and we are talking about batteries here. So what do you think about hydrogen? I give it two aspects, and, and I hand over to you. Um, first thing, um, hydrogen, for example, plays a role in, in, battery, in batteries very much, uh, especially in battery manufacturing. So we do need uh, lots of energy to manufacture cells. And 
well, whenever you talk about recycling, et cetera, overall, it's important to kind of consider the entire footprint of the entire product uh, actually looping one cycle. That's the footprint we are really interested in. So and obviously, there's lots of energy uh, we need to put in to first time generate a battery cell. So that's why, for example, you can go and say, well, where are solar panels? Where is wind uh, energy? Where is uh, actually energy just more than demand you have? and simply put your um, put your plant right there. That's what we're doing. So usually battery cell plants are put kind of close to where the infrastructure for energy actually is already existing. So now what's the next thing? Well, if you look into hydrogen, you can classify them into, well, brown um, hydrogen, blue one, and green one. Green one is obviously fully uh, sustainable. Brown one as well, I guess you get, you get it. Yeah, and that is what we currently have, uh, most of it. Uh, just, just to give you a comparison, the amount of CO2 we currently emit um, just for generating uh, hydrogen overall worldwide is the same amount we burn in all airplanes. So just to give an idea, we do have lots of brown hydrogen, which doesn't really help us. So what I'm saying is it really makes sense, and that's, for example, the planning of our, our next plant is we do have actually our plant right at a crossing between uh, hydrogen pipelines coming from renewable energies. So that's a significant portion for us to reduce the, the, um, the, the footprint. When it comes to now to vehicles, and that's the introduction in the end for you, um, I, I know this very much from my OEM times, um, so from car manufacturing. Um, We've, got, we've, we've run a lot of uh, simulations and simply try to understand when would we prefer actually um, electrified versus um, um, hybrid uh, versus um, hydrogen. And there's a couple of patterns you can simply kind of easily say, but finally you need to have a very close look. But one of them is if the dynamics are very high, then usually battery makes a lot of sense because you would like to gain back the energy um, so by, by recuperation, etc. So, so I'm kind of city hopping, etc. small commutes, high dynamics, that makes very much sense with batteries. If you just go kind of um, very long, uh, long range and you like to go simply kind of uh, steady state, not too much changes, etc., then usually hydrogen uh, comes in and becomes more effective, etc. Whenever you've got something in between or a combination, you might go for hybrid. Um, so that's pretty much, I guess, um, um, also theoretically and practically uh, tested. And it's, I guess, coming also for trucks, etc. That's pretty tempting. Um, and I guess for, for aviation, they will uh, close, most probably watch this closely and then pick the raisins and uh, cherry picking. Oh, I, I, Shorty. Short, oh. I would say third law of thermodynamics basically rules out hydrogen as an energy carrier. There's too many losses in the conversion. As Dirk says, 99% of hydrogen today is produced as a side product of oil and gas. It's, it's not a clean product. And we should also uh, realize that hydrogen today is a technical gas which is used in all kinds of processes, chemical industry, or when you need a high temperature, for example, steel industry. So what needs to be done, there needs to be green hydrogen for where you need the molecule. What I don't think is a very good idea is saying we're going to use hydrogen as an energy carrier because we need to have uh, five times the amount of solar panels uh, in, in, instead of when you would charge uh, or use this energy to charge batteries. And I think um, uh, there is a little bit too much focus on the hydrogen economy. I think there's a very, very strong lobby of oil and gas behind because they need to replace their current product with a new one. Um, for aviation, you need to solve more technical problems. The basic components aren't there for hydrogen electric, so it will be hydrogen burning. You have an energy density advantage gravimetrically, but not volumetric, so you need to build these huge kind of beluga types of aircraft with a few passengers inside. <laughs> It will not happen before 2030, I promise you. All right. Talking about 2030, uh, there's no question out there, right? Final question from my side. Now, imagine we are meeting here for the Festival of the Future 2030. How did you get the, uh, here? Still by bike. <laughs> not with your Cyan, second generation then? <laughs> I still like trains because <laughs> there it's good to work and you can just uh, yeah enjoy the time if it's working better than currently with all the delays and stuff. But yeah, I like that. <laughs> I well, I came by bike today as well, but I might be might be walking even. It's nice to walk in the city. And I'm actually hoping for EV toll. Well, at least one uh, one who wants some change. But biking and uh, walking and trains are fine too. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, great insights. Feel free to grab them if you want to know more about their great startups. 
And we have a short break here. Now we have a longer break here now, and then we come back for a panel on regenerative economy. So we will talk about circularity again because it's such a hot topic and such an important topic. And in the meantime, feel free to check out our experience area and the other stages and talk to our panelists if you want to know more in more private, uh, in a more private environment. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing this with us. That was great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.